Hi, TDF peeps. I'm Francis Jew. And I'm Gina Quintas. And we're starring in Elong Liu's new play, Good Enemy, at Audible Theater, the Mineta Lane Theater down in the village. I play Howard, a Chinese immigrant to America, who has a secret past that he's keeping from his daughter, um, who is driving across the country to see her. And I play Momo, Howard's daughter, college student, TikToker, and um, she is completely blindsided by her father's surprise visit to her in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I am a Chinese middle-aged man with a shaved head. I'm sitting in my um, study, uh, uh, and behind me is a stack of books that I mean to read someday. And I am a Filipino woman, late 20s. I'm sitting in my apartment. There's a piano to my right. There are some frames on the wall behind me and a huge uh, plant that is to the right of me as well. <laughs> Let's get to it. Great. Gina, how did you become involved in Elong Liu's world premiere play, Good Enemy? Well, um, how I got involved was I was doing a workshop with Che Yu, our director. I was doing a workshop with him for a new show, a new play at, at uh, the Kennedy Center. And um, after our first read through, I had never met Che before, but after our first read through, I then got a request to audition for uh, a new show called Good Enemy. And I read the, the sides and I quickly became very obsessed with who this character was. <laughs> um, I loved it. I instantly connected with her and um, I put it on tape and I'm so happy that it that it worked out. I love the play. I, I love the language and I'm really, really excited to be working with Che again. And Francis, how did you become involved in Yulong Lu's world premiere of Good Enemy? Well, right when the shutdown happened and nobody was working and remember when we all thought we were all gonna like get back to the theater in June, you know, like <laughs> somewhere around then yeah. when I got a call from Che saying, what are you doing? And I'm like, nothing. And he said, well, I've got a, a, a play reading and we're gonna do it on Zoom mm -hmm. so that we're all safe. And uh, we can all like call in from wherever we are. And um, it was, Elong's play, and um, I really fell in love with it, with the way that it time travels, with the way that it deals with um, memory and family relations. You know, um, I think that it, it's something that um, I've been thinking a, a lot about. You know, what do you tell the next generation? What do you want them to know about you and your past? And, and what don't you want them to know? And um, so, uh, and how that's even much more complicated by being an immigrant. And so I, I fell in love with it and did, I don't know how many different readings of it. And then suddenly there was an actual production. I'm so grateful to Audible um, that we're actually doing this and recording it as an audio play as well. Yes. That's very, very exciting. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. You performed together in the musical Soft Power pre-pandemic. Is that how you met? And did already knowing each other help inform your relationship as father and daughter in Good Enemy? I <laughs> jumped up and down when I saw the cast list finally and found out that um, you were playing my daughter. I, I just adore you. I, and, and for those who don't know, um, we did Soft Power together and I just think Gina can do anything. She can sing, she can dance, she can act, she's got she can do any kind of style. I mean, she's just she's just mutable. And so I thought, finally, I'll get a chance really to like have scene work with her um, in this in this great play. And it did help knowing you. Um, I think it's it's informed a lot. Do you think it helped or did, did it hurt <laughs> knowing me from Soft Power? <laughs> well, I same. So they they had released your name first. Um, I like, I'm not going to tell Francis yet because I want it to be a big surprise because I was, I was jumping up and down and I, I even, you know, I stopped myself from texting you or letting you know that I was a part of it because I knew before I think you even did. And I, I'm just so excited exactly to do scene work with you. 
to be able to to work with you. I mean, it's been like a dream of mine to work with you again and again and again. And uh, I mean, I feel I feel the same way. You can do anything, Francis, and it's you can do anything and everything. And it's really exciting to do this specific thing with you, this beautiful play, to have this beautiful relationship come alive. And um, you know, not that we have a father daughter relationship in real life, <laughs> but. Yep. Um, I've definitely, you know, looked to you for advice and looked to you for, you know, words of wisdom. You've, I, and you've, you've helped me so much along the way and I, I can trust you, you know, and I have deep respect for you. And so I think, I think it does, I think it does help our relationship. Yeah. I think that, um, us having worked together, uh, in the past, I think has helped me because I, you know, I've. I already knew how much I admire you and how much I think of you as part of a new generation of performer, um, of Asian American performer, uh, who isn't like apologizing for being here, you know, for taking space, for taking the time that you need to do your work and to tell your stories. And, um, You've already, you know, worked on new plays. You've already worked on new musicals. You, you, um, you just have a, a, a confidence, or what I, I, what appears to me to be a confidence in at least in what it is that you have to offer. And when I was young, and and uh, uh, in the first say decade of of doing this as a profession, I didn't have that necessarily. I was trying to peg myself into where I thought non-traditional casting was, was happening. Um, and so, you know, aimed for uh, institutional theaters that were doing non-traditional casting, casting uh, 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 classical th uh, theater, um, uh, where, you know, the majority of non-traditional casting was being done um, because it wasn't happening in contemporary theater. And people at that time were not there were, you know, a handful, if that, of Asian American playwrights who were being produced, and and now there are so many more opportunities. Um, we still we still haven't broken into Broadway the way that I I think is um, equitable um, or you know human, uh, but I I I I think that we've come so so uh, so far, and and you are a, the perfect example of that in my mind. Thank you, Francis. And you are a part. You are a part of that. You're part of of how I think the younger generation of Asian American people who want to do this are are made to feel like we can do anything. I mean, I you know we've spoke about this before, but I I think that you have created such um, you you've shown us what is possible, and you've shown us that we can. We can do whatever we want to do. I mean, seeing you in soft power really, um, you know, really help put that in for me. Of, of I can, I can hold my own space. I can hold my own. I can say what I need to say, and I can live inside of my experience with without shame or without any apologies. Mm -hmm. so I really, I look up to you so, so much, Francis. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was, I was told a long time ago. Um, there's, there's something inside of you that knows that there's something that you want to say. And if you listen to that, whether you're poor, whether you're hungry, you will keep doing this. But if you don't really believe that there's something like that in there, then you don't need to do this work. It's, it's you know, too painful to reject it's, all the time. That, yeah. is, that is true. <laughs> true. No, but that's a beautiful thing. In the play, I find out most of what I know about my daughter's life, Momo's life, through TikTok uh, since she has gone away to college. Do you love or loathe social media? And have you ever discovered something surprising about a loved one through it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess I have, I'm gonna take this one. Okay, um, I'll take it first. So um, I, during lockdown, I feel like I had like the, the, the opposite reaction of everyone uh, when it came to social media. I think at first I was totally participating in, in like the, the, you know, the challenges and what everyone was doing because mm -hmm. everyone was on there. And then it quickly became so overwhelming for me. You know, I, 
And then I, I did this thing where I just like cut myself off from it. I, mm. I, I told myself, you know what? I'm going to take the weekend or something. I was like, I'm going to take the weekend to not be on social media at all. And the rest is history. I, I don't, I'm not really on it very much. Wow. Um, I still have it, you know, to, you know, you know, give some updates or what, whatever it is, keep up with family. Um, but I definitely like had a, a big, a big break from it. Um, and in terms of discovering something about a family member on social media, I mean, you know, without disclosing so much, I think what the most shocking thing for me on social media is that I have nephews who are now like in their late teens mm. who have social media. And so sometimes I'll, you know, go on and I'll pull it up and I'll see something on a feed and I'm like, oh, I didn't know that you know, they were celebrating their anniversary of dating for a few years. And, you know, it's just, it's those things. I mean, it's great. It's also great. But I think for me, it's like, oh gosh, I'm like an old auntie. And it's just like a <laughs> reminder, a reminder of, of, of those things. How about you, Francis? You know, I've heard of TikTok. I, <laughs> <they're> all, <laughs> I think it was during soft power that somebody in the company actually uh, helped me create my account on Instagram even because I had just, ref I just like, it's so confusing to me, you know, this whole idea of like posting stuff and like not expecting necessarily a conversation, like a right. give, take, it just like, here, take it. It just, it just feels really <laughs> rude in so many ways, but I feel obligated at least on you know, Twitter and Facebook and yes. Instagram to like post about what I'm doing um, to let people know, you know, to help sell tickets, you know, especially now when um, people are still afraid to come to the theater sometimes and, and uh, people are discovering new ways of, of finding what it, what it is going on out there. Um, I feel obligated to, to uh, post how excited I am about the things that I'm doing. And then I, I like, seeing posts of, you know, what my friends are doing and, and stuff like that too. Yeah. Um, and, you know, occasionally I'll get surprised, you know, when somebody posts something, you know, really serious about an illness or, or something like that. And that's just, you know, um, I'm grateful, I guess, to social media for that because I don't know, you know, whether somebody would send out a mass email or something like that to their friends if they were doing something like that. Um, and it's just a much easier way to communicate that way. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I don't know that I've figured it out at all. I mean, most of the time I'm just furiously posting on, on Twitter about, you know, political stuff and getting out the vote and like just being mad. <laughs> That's the place to do it, really. Just tweet out your feelings. <laughs> I, I'm right there with you. But I am also, I, I hear you on, you know, those updates that you wouldn't necessarily get from people no. that are just far away from you and you haven't heard mm -hmm. of in a while. It's, it's really a really nice way to keep up, you know, the, the small updates here and there. And, you know, this is going to be posted on social media or some sort of thing. You know, I feel like it's a great way of, for people to know what's going on, just in mm. general especially with our lives, because we, we travel so much, we just keep moving to where the work is. And so most of my family's in the Bay Area. Where's where's most of your family? Here in New York and some in Houston, some in Boston. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great way to keep in touch. Exactly. So part of the play takes place during the first year of the pandemic with a crisis inspiring father and daughter to try to come closer. How did the pandemic impact your familial relationships? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been together with Randy for 34 years. And, but um, uh, we met when he was the managing director at TheaterWorks in Palo Alto. And, you know, two and a half years after we met, uh, I got the call to join the Broadway company of M Butterfly as the new understudy. And um, since then, we've been sort of, we were long distance for decades. And I would try to, you know, get work back in the Bay Area so that we would have a chunk of time where I was living at home. And he would come visit me wherever I was sometimes. And he would love to come into New York to see shows and stuff like that. And, um, 
and, and then in 19, what, what no, 2005-ish, he left Theater Works and, and, and came to New York to form um, his own production company, Junkyard Dog Production. So we've lived together in New York since then. Um, so, but I was still like moving all over the place to, to do work. And so the shutdown was really like the first time, the first time that we had spent that much time together. Oh yeah. <laughs> and, um, I, 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 you know, as soon as that June passed and it was like, oh, maybe we'll see each other in September, but I, I don't think so. I think this is going to last a long time. And it was like, oh my God, like how many things can we bake? And, <laughs> you know, um, you know, we, we don't really like, we don't go to the gym or exercise together. And, you know, I would ask him out to go for a walk and he would like, no, no, you're, you're slower than I am. Cause he's much taller than I am. And so, you know, he would go on his own and, um, but we survived. I mean, I really, I really liked, you know, being retired for a moment with Randy. That was, that was great. That was a great discovery that we could actually live together after all these years. That's lovely. Yeah. And you're in this apartment in yeah. New York. Yeah. Did yeah. you ever leave? Did it, we, no, during all that time we didn't leave. I mean, um, I, I had to go uh, shoot a couple things because mm -hmm. as soon as, like shortly after in the summer of um, 2020, um, television and film started shooting again. So I had sh brief moments when I would like go for a week here, a couple weeks there. Um, but no, we were there yeah. together. And um, it was more than a year, year and a half before I like went on a, uh, uh, really went on a trip or in, or he went on a trip to London. I can't remember now, but yeah, we were, we really hunkered down here in Midtown. Yeah, same here. I, I didn't, I didn't leave really at all. I mean, for, um, we, we did make one road trip to go see my sister in Houston mm. as a family. And that was, that was, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was a road trip yeah. <laughs> um, well. and it was nice. Um, but you know, I think for me, uh, much like what happens in the play, I, I ended up living with my parents and my sister. And, um, I think it did uncover a lot of things that needed to be spoken that haven't been spoken about over the years. Um, and I mean, it's in a great way, you know, in a way that made us um, really understand each other better. And I think also to help my parents understand who I am as an adult and mm. help me understand who my parents were as re uh, retired people now living mm. in their home. And, and so I think there was a lot that we learned about each other. And I think that we are, so much closer for it. That's so great. Yeah. That's you know? Good Enemy is hilarious one minute and harrowing the next, especially during flashback scenes in 1984 China. Um, how do you handle those tonal shifts, Gina? Hmm. Uh, it's, that's an interesting, that's an interesting one. I feel like, um, you know, if I were someone watching as an audience member, mm. it, it's so exciting because you go on a ride, you know, you, you're sort of, you're so immersed. I mean, Elon makes this world of the play as one play, but then also when you come back from 18, 1980s scenes to the present day scenes, they're all in their own little bubble too. You know, he's really mm -hmm. creating a way of, of, um, almost isolating the world. And so you sort of just jump in. And um, that's how I think I feel when I'm, when I'm in our present day scenes, I'm able to just jump into our, um, to our scenes and the, the hilarious moments that, that happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know, I, I think, of course, it's, you know, it's hard when you're watching the, the, the intensity of what's going on in the 1980s scenes, but um, dropping into the present day scenes is sort of a breath of fresh air is how I see it. Mm. How about you, Francis? Well, you know, I, I think I like um, food that like has both 
sweet and savory. I like, you know, contrasting textures in food and, and stuff like that. And um, uh, I like a little salt on my chocolate, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. And, and I think that that's life. I mean, life is, you know, re I mean, look around at the world right now. Yeah. The world is so uncertain and leadership is like in flux and we don't, we have choices now where really drastic changes could happen um, depending on what road we collectively choose to go down or are we not going to collectively choose anything together anymore? You know, th those kinds of things. And you stick around with those, you know, really troubling things long enough and it becomes hilarious. You know, it's just, people are ridiculous. Yes. And um, so I, I, I just, I don't think about tonal shifts. I think of them all as the same part of being human. And, um, you know, you, it, uh, so I, I don't, I don't think of them as, shifts so much because I'm, I'm kind I'm kind of feeling all of that at the same time now too. Well, it's true because there's some, even in the, the scenes that take place in China, there's so much, there's so many hilarious moments. There's so many moments of, uh, I don't know, just satisfying human connection, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that, that, that it's not, um, precious or um, mythologized. That's right. It's, ju it's just these people. Exactly. Yeah. You've both been in plays that use traumatic history as a backdrop for personal stories, including Cambodian rock band and Miss Saigon. Did you learn anything about China in the 80s while rehearsing? Wow. Um, a little. We, we were provided a dramaturgical packet. Um, mostly what I, I've read up on is um, how the 80s in China was a, a, an experiment in opening up in um, recreating the economy uh, to become a more, uh, less of an isolated country and more of a global economic uh, country, um, but that it all, wound up at Tiananmen Square in 1989. Yeah. When the political and social shutdown happened literally on TV, you know, and uh, for everyone to see. And um, so, uh, I, 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 you know, this, this struggle that we, was happening in China that, you know, in many ways we're still, we are all still struggling with how much do we need government to participate in our lives? How much do we need government to help us organize our lives? And how much freedom should we actually have to, to just be ourselves, you know, but still be part of a community? I mean, we're, we're still all trying to answer those questions. Exactly. I did, think, you, I think did you do a lot of studying for the show? Um, well, you know, I... I learned, I feel like I did learn a lot about China in the 80s and the Cultural Revolution and Tiananmen Square. Um, I, you know, I, I feel like I had somewhat of an idea of what, of what happened um, and then doing a deep dive in a dramaturgical packet and then also doing some research on my own. Um, I, I definitely came to those conclusions also, what you felt. And then, and then also learning about, um, I guess, how, how this history has informed its current political climate, you know, and our mm. political climate, you know, it's, 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 um, it's so rich. And I think there's so much that we don't know. And I, there's so much that informed me through the play, you know, through mm -hmm. what Elong has, has um, chosen some characters to, to disclose about what happened at the time. Um, it's really like piqued my curiosity. And I, I, I did do a lot of research because um, I just, it's almost hard to believe, right. That, um, that things like that happened. And it's mm. not even that long ago, you know, it happened in the eighties. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, it was, it was actually a really cool, um, research study for me, <laughs> um, to also then also be dropped into the world of the play. 
I think part of what I, I loved researching too was immigration, recent, yes. more recent immigration to the United States and yes. our attitude towards immigration and how they've changed over time. Um, and, you know, how, and, and what kind, what, what those, that experience of immigrating um, or being a refugee or escaping where you were, you know, as opposed to immigrating, which, right. you know, there are so many different ways that people come to this country and what, what, what do they bring with them? You know, they bring hopes and dreams and ideas of what America is that have been broadcast all over the world, soft power. Um, uh, but they also bring with them their own culture and, and their own, the way that they grew up. And, and then they also bring, you know, the trauma of, you know, the experience of actually coming to the country. And, and what does that do to them and, and then the next generation? So I, 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 I actually read up a, a little bit more about my own family, where that's concerned. Wow. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm sure there was a lot learned there. <laughs> and a lot that we'll never know now. Sure. You know, because generations have passed and we couldn't get them to talk. Right. Wow. <laughs> That's our show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, TDF is bringing a full house of students to see Good Enemy. What do you hope teenagers take away from the play? Oh my God, I didn't know the TDF was bringing a house of, of teenagers to the show until I saw that question. And that's really exciting to me. Yeah. Um, and I fully expect them to um, make their opinions known during the play. Oh yeah. Uh, because it presents all sorts of generational uh, perspectives, as, you know, and, and, and I think that young people are just so much more informed than I was when I was a teenager about things like immigration, things like um, uh, just world events, you know, and, and politics today and, and, and stuff like that. I think it, I'm really excited for that. Agreed. I'm so excited for, for young folks to come see the show. I think it's um, a really exciting opportunity to learn about China in the 80s like I I just think that it's um I I would love for them to to leave with lots of questions and mm. to feel curious about um more of the history and at the same time like you said jumping from generations um you know if there are children the young folks that have parents who are generation zero you know mm -hmm. I hope that they leave with um maybe a, a better understanding of, of where they're coming from or wanting to know more about these people in their lives. And I think that is so important. I think that it is, I hope that it, it, it allows them to feel okay about having those questions mm. about the people in their lives that may not talk and disclose much, but that it is, it is okay to ask questions and it is okay to want to feel closer. Um, yeah. So that's, I really hope that that, that lands for them. That's great. I wonder how many of them are going to go home and start asking their folks. <laughs> I, I also, you know, because it's New York City, I, ex I am, am hoping that it's a really diverse crowd of kids. Definitely. And, you know, the opportunity as a teenager to see a story that centers on people that look like us, I think is really cool. We just don't get that as often at, um, uh, as I think, um, I would like, or that we all need. And um, uh, I, I think it just helps, you know, in an age when anti-Asian violence is, is surging, um, in a time when people feel it's okay to just use racial slurs and all, I mean, all kinds of things. It's just, you know, that's what theater does. It just allows us to see other people as human beings who may have the same kinds of issues that they have, or there may be things that they identif uh, identify with. Um, and um, I think, to, I, I just think we need more of that. Exactly. We are both actors of Asian descent, um, starring in a play by an Asian playwright. Um, would you like to talk about the power of telling your own cultural stories? Well, 
to the point you just made, Francis, I mean, it's, I think that what feels most important and powerful for me is the ability to, to give humanity to, to a group of people that I think are otherwise um, undervalued, um, overlooked, um, not, not given, not given an understanding or more, more humanity to. I think mm. what you're saying about theater, this, I mean, to be able to tell our stories, to be able to be people on stage connecting and uncovering our relationships and dissecting it. And I think that's, that's so important for people to see, because I think there's, um, especially in a time where there's a lot of violence and there's a lot of hate um, stemming from not understanding who we are as people, I think, I think it's a really great opportunity for us to, to step in with something to say mm -hmm. and change a person's perspective on, on a group of people that they otherwise would have a bias towards. And I, I mean, it's so incredible that we are able to have more opportunities to do that now. And I do think that we could use obviously more and more and more, um, always, right? Um, but I'm I'm so grateful to to Audible and the Meta Lane for for producing Yulong's play because I think it does an incredible job of of showing who we are, and it gives us the opportunity as Asian actors to 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 step in. And you know, I think it also I think it also is um, powerful for people who aren't even of Asian descent, of any of any descent, you know, of for people to know that there there is an opportunity to to show who you are and to not apologize and to not be ashamed. And, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I think it's I think it's really important. Yeah, there there I think of it in, uh, in two different lines of thought. One is just employment, you know, um, it's a very subjective field, you know, acting and, uh, and at the same time, there are certain people who have to deal with um, certain restrictions on employment that other people don't, um, because we are seen as Asian first. Yes. Um, people with disabilities may be seen with uh, they're, you know, as, as a person with a disability first, before they're seen, evaluated for their skill, for their capacity, for, you know, human connection or whatever the, the role may require. Um, you know, there's so many breakdowns, um, uh, you know, where you'll have these paragraphs about each character and then you'll see like Asian male forties. And it's like, well, ooh. Who is this person? Who is this person? Yeah. You know, give me a clue. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, um, and it, it isn't just about, you know, making money and making a living. It's also about, you know, how we grow as artists. And, you know, I think that, you know, when you've got a, a community that's been starved of opportunity, you've also been starving them of the opportunity to grow yes. and to develop their own voices and their own skills. And, um, so it, it, I think that it, employment is one very important line of thought where I, I think representation is concerned. And then the second is exactly what you were talking about. Representation matters because it helps us see what's possible, you know, not just as people with careers in theater, but anybody for what's possible in their own lives to articulate in their own lives, to be in their own lives. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, I think is um, one of the things that I take most seriously about being in this biz and why I, I think I've chosen the path that I've chosen. You know, um, I, I, I've i turned down, you know, stuff that pays a lot of money for stuff that doesn't pay that much money, that isn't going to be seen by that many people, but offers an opportunity in that community for people to see something they've never seen before that, you know, will suddenly enlighten us all, myself included, um, to what's possible. I agree with that completely. I, I have also been on the journey of saying no to things that don't mm. align with how I feel I want to be represented or representing. 
Mm -hmm. I'm not going to continue to say yes to things that I know are going to be hurtful or damaging Mm -hmm. to how we're represented as Asian people, as Asian American people in, in what we do. I think it's time that, um, I mean, I'm definitely, you know, putting my money where my mouth is because yeah. in terms of employment, right? It's also, that's that's also tricky. You know, I, I can't say no to everything or I'll never be working. Right. Um, but it's definitely to the point where I'm like, you know what? I'm going to be more picky because this is my act of resistance. This is my, this is my way of um, uh, feeling like I'm doing something at least hopefully revolutionary in terms of making sure that people know that we won't stand for that. Mm-hmm. We want to be, we want to be represented with, with a lot of humanity. You know, we want to be full realized people. And for me, that doesn't necessarily always mean playing a hero or somebody who always does the right thing or knows the, you know, it is the most, um, sage about the situation. I, I'm, you know, I, I overheard Che, our director at one point, saying how he really enjoyed how hostile I could be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so good. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, well, yeah, I wasn't really thinking of it in those terms because I just think, that, you know, we're, all, you know, I, I, I love the idea that we can be anything and that we, we as, that as human beings, we are capable of so much. If I was put in that situation, who says that I wouldn't choose exactly that? Mm-hmm. You know, given the, the, the narrow range of possible of, of alternatives, you know, uh, why wouldn't I become a mass murderer? Why wouldn't I, you know, um, estrange my daughter? Why wouldn't I yell at somebody um, who annoyed me? Because yeah, uh, because people do. And, um, you know, we're, we're capable of all of that, I think, yeah. as long as there's a whole range. Exactly. Hey, Gina, what's the best deal you ever got at the TKTS booth? Oh, man, it's really hard to give one deal because I have gotten so many <laughs> incredible deals <laughs> from TKTS and TDF. Mm. I mean, it's just been an opportunity for, for me to be able to experience some of the greatest actors and greatest shows and productions that are happening on Broadway, off Broadway, um, concerts even, you know, and I've been able to, um, with the deals, be able to actually be able to see them with my family, my whole family and Mm -hmm. treat treat our parents. My sister and I can treat our parents to something or, um, you know, go go with a friend. It's just such an incredible way to make theater accessible. And that's, I mean, it's so, it's so incredibly helpful, and it means a lot. How about you, Francis? What's the best deal you've gotten? Well, in 1981, I came to New York, and uh, I was a senior in high school, and I was looking at schools. And on the way back, um, I, my friends and I stopped in New York um, to see shows because we were all theater kids. Mm-hmm. I was in the chorus of musicals. I, I didn't talk very much to people because I was very shy, but I loved musicals. And um, we didn't have, well, I didn't have much money. So we would just stand in line at TKTS. And and I I gotta say, we got, I got to see um, Bring Back Birdie with Cheetah Rivera. Uh, I got to see um, Fosse um, and, and I got to see a chorus line on Broadway. Wow. But then I got to see um, Amadeus mm-hmm. with Ian McKellen. Oh, and I'll, I'll just, I, I will never forget that experience. Sitting in the back of the orchestra, crammed in with people and it was cold outside. So everyone had their coats and stuff like that. And, um, and just seeing him while the audience was filing in, sitting in this wheelchair, facing upstage. And then when the lights dimmed, him just simply turning the chair around, like, oh my God, he's been sitting out there all that time. And I just, I was, I was just enthralled with um, his commitment, his mm-hmm. passion and his skill. 
um, in, in, in that play. And, and, you know, secretly, you know, although I'd only ever been in the chorus of, of musicals at that point, I, I, you know, like Oliver, My Fair Lady, uh, which I all loved, secretly, I was like, I want to do that. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's so exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And it was all because I could afford to do it because of TDF. That's right. Exactly. Last question. I'm going to be a casting director for you and you're going to be a casting director for me. What role would you put me in? Um, okay. So, Francis. <laughs> uh -oh. Uh -oh. You can do anything under the sun. Mm. This is true. You do musicals, you do plays, you do anything. So and there's so many things that I would put you in. Um, I would love to see you play Richard III. Have you ever? What? Yes. Really? Yes. Well, I mean, speaking, you know, speaking to what you just said of like, we can do anything and why wouldn't I react mm. that way? And these, these things that become uncovered, I mean, I think that is such like a meaty rich person to dive into and I think I mean I would pay big bucks big bucks to see you in that also I would love to see you as <laughs> the engineer in Miss Saigon I think you could just uh, completely rock the house and um and as the whiz and was in in um, Wicked <laughs> oh my god I would I would love to see it oh my god not okay. Elsa I mean, listen, I like I said, you can do anything, you can really play an array of roles in Wicked. Oh my God. <laughs> I hope, well, I hope you like those. I'm, I, I'm, I'm truly flattered by the whole range of, of those roles. Um, the first thing that came to mind, you know, seeing you and working with you in this play, I, I you know, the, gr the grass is always greener. So it was like, I've been longing to hear you sing again. Mm. And the first thing that came in, first thing that came in, popped in my mind was, I would love to see Gina uh, star in Waitress. Like, I would love it. I just think that you would kill, you, first of all, you can sing anything. You've got, you know, a legit voice. You can sing pop, you can sing rock. I mean, you just can do, you've got a range, like, you can sing anything. So um, I've seen you rap. Um, <laughs> I mean, oh my God. So, you know, I, I just thought that, and because I think, I think there are performers who walk out on stage and you instantly have a feeling about who they are. And either they fall in love with you or they instantly hate you. You know, like, I don't want to see certain actors ever play a sympathetic character because they're so good at playing people who are greasy and evil and you just love seeing them be evil, you know? And then there are other characters who are just like, you wouldn't want them ever to do, you know, play a murderer because they're just so innocent and lovely and you just want them to, they're just fantastic. You know, um, they're people you, you just fall in love with and, and you're one of those. Um, so I thought of that, but then in terms of plays, I was also thinking, you know, um, that I, I would just love to see you tackle, you know, something completely out of the norm. Like what if you did Hamlet? You know, why, why not? Um, <laughs> I, I just, I, I think that you have the capacity and the skill because, you know, you, you're not only thinking in terms of when, when I watch you work, you're not only thinking in terms of one way of working like, um, method or, or Uta Hagen or, or whatever people teach these days. I, I never went to school. So I only just read on my own any of these things. So this is only what I imagine those techniques are. But, you know, I also see you looking very, you know, um, skillfully at the rhythm of speech, at meter, at what that can tell you about a character, how they speak. You know, I, I love that you said that you love the language in Elong's play because, yeah, I mean, each of these characters speaks in such an individual way and the way that they speak and just analyzing that can tell you so much about their character and you're smart enough to, to know to do that. And so, yeah. Thanks, Francis. Waitress and Hamlet. That's I, all. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, TDF. Thank you, TDF. This was great. This is 
so much fun. It was so much fun. We'll we'll um continue this conversation during tech. Oh yes, okay? definitely.